In this video, we're going to be going over the evaluation and diagnosis of wide complex tachycardias, which as a resident in internal medicine may be very frightening the first time you see it, because you may be presented with an EKG that looks something like this, and you'll be kind of scratching your head in terms of wondering, is this ventricular tachycardia or is this SVT with aberrancy? So in this video, let's talk about how to evaluate that. So first off, let's start with the framework for evaluating tachycardia in general. And a really good one that I like to use is first off just asking, is this a narrow complex tachycardia or is this a wide complex tachycardia? And the next step after that is to ask, is this regular in terms of its rhythm or is it irregular? And the same thing for a wide complex tachycardia. Immediately, just based off this classification, you can start forming a good differential diagnosis. So for regular narrow complex tachycardias, uh, our options are gonna be sinus tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and a junctional tachycardia. For irregular narrow complex tachycardias, our most common ones are gonna be atrial fibrillation, multifocal atrial tachycardia, and A flutter, with variable AV conduction. Now moving on to our wide complex tachycardias, if the rhythm is regular, we're really gonna be trying to differentiate between ventricular tachycardia and SVT with aberrancy, which what does that even mean? So SVT with aberrancy is basically gonna be like your AVNRT or AVRT, but a patient is gonna have a baseline bundle branch block. Most often it's gonna be a right bundle branch block, and this is gonna cause the QRS complex to be prolonged thus making a wide complex regular tachycardia. And then finally, another option that we have here is gonna be pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Next, we're gonna move on to irregular wide complex tachycardias, and that's really gonna be polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, also known as torsades, and then ventricular fibrillation. So obviously in this video, we're gonna be focusing on the regular wide complex tachycardias. And the key question that you're really gonna be asked about a lot here is how do we differentiate between ventricular tachycardia and SVT with aberrancy? So first, a couple of disclaimers before you go and evaluate whether this is SVT or VT. So in basically any of these abnormal rhythms, if the patient is unstable, then you basically just wanna shock them and you don't have time to try and figure out what exact rhythm that they have. The other thing is that if you're ever not really sure, then you should basically assume it's VT because VT is much more common than SVT with aberrancy. At least 80 to 90% of cases are going to be VT. And the other thing is that mistreating ventricular tachycardia is much more dangerous than potentially mistreating SVT with aberrancy. So in all cases, especially when time is limited or you're not totally sure, it's always safer to assume that it's ventricular tachycardia. All right, so now let's just really get into the meat of how we differentiate between SVT and VT. And one of the first things you're really going to consider is is the patient and their history. So patients who are older than age 35 have any previous cardiac conditions, uh, any history of an MI or cardiac ischemia, or if they have an ICD placed, these are basically telltale signs that it's much more likely gonna be VT rather than SVT with aberrancy. And on the other hand, if the patient is relatively healthy, their age is less than 35, and they've never had any cardiac problems before, then you can maybe consider SVT with aberrancy. But even then, you have to be careful, like I said before, with the caveat that it's always safer to assume VT. But usually, SVT with aberrancy is gonna be in your healthy young patients. And so next, I just wanna show you some really great YouTube video resources that I found, which really give a lot of the different criteria that you're gonna look for to, that would suggest VT potentially. And this one's by somebody named MedTube, and they really list a lot of great criteria. So for ventricular tachycardia, you're typically going to see very broad QRS complexes, greater than 160 milliseconds. Whereas with SVT with aberration, QRS complexes are typically going to actually be less than 140 milliseconds. The next thing to look for in VT is AV dissociation. So AV dissociation uh, is almost basically pathognomonic for VT. And if you see that, it's highly specific. Specific, whereas SVT with aberration is not going to see AV dissociation. So for AV dissociation, what you're going to be looking for is basically you're going to find P waves that are kind of marching along with no correlation to the QRS complexes. So you can see here there's a Q wave embedded in this wave right here. And then you have another Q wave here. You can see they're kind of in different spots. And so this is showing you that there's AV dissociation. The next thing you're going to look for is capture beats and fusion beats. So first of all, what are capture beats? Capture beats are when your sinus node actually 
fires and it is able to capture the ventricle at basically the exact right timing. So you actually get a normal depolarization. And in that situation, what you're going to find is you're actually going to have all of these bizarre wide QRS complexes with the ventricular tachycardia, but all of a sudden you're going to see a normally conducted QRS complex. And that again is going to be highly suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. The next thing you want to look for is fusion beats. So fusion beats are kind of similar to capture beats, but this time it's kind of the atria and the ventricles depolarizing at the same time. And what results is you get this kind of hybrid complex that's in between a normal QRS complex and the bizarre wide QRS complex of VTAC. So in this scenario here, we have multiple beats of VTAC, and all of a sudden you have this kind of intermediate QRS complex, which is going to be a fusion beat. And that's because the atria and the ventricle are kind of depolarizing at the same time, making this fusion complex. And then here you can see two capture beats actually following this because these are kind of more normal QRS complexes. The next thing you want to look for is Brugada sign. And Brugada sign is basically you're going to look for the R to S interval. So you look for the beginning of the R wave to the nadir of the S wave. And if that's greater than 100 milliseconds, that's suggestive of VT. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Then we also have the Josephson sign, which is defined by this uh, notch in the uh, S wave as you go down. So this notch and then this prolonged RS interval, again, are both signs of ventricular tachycardia. You also have RSR prime complexes in VT with a taller left rabbit ear, whereas RSR prime complexes in SVT with aberrancy are usually going to have a taller right rabbit ear. So if you take a look here, VT, we're going to have this tall left rabbit ear with a huge uh, S wave coming down here. And then with SVT with aberrancy, we get this uh, appearance here. We have an RSR prime with a taller right rabbit ear. Next thing you're going to look for is positive or negative concordance throughout the precordial chest leads. So this basically means that all of the complexes from V1 through V six are all going upwards or they're all going downwards. And this also means that you don't have any what are called RS complexes where you have the QRS going up and then down. They're basically all going in one direction. And so if you see any concordance, whether it's positive or negative, then that's basically diagnostic for VT rather than SVT. So here's an example of positive concordance. You can see everything is just up going just like this. And then next we have a, an example of negative concordance where all of the QRS complexes are basically purely down going uh, throughout all of the chest leads. Here's another video that I really liked from a channel called Medical Snippet, which goes through these criteria and also gives some great pictures of this as well. So one of the other criteria they look for is extreme axis deviation. And for this, you're actually looking for what's called a northwest axis. So that's going to be when the axis is pointed all the way to this direction of the heart. And so you're looking for a negative QRS in lead one and AVL, and then a positive QRS complex in AVR. And we'll talk about that later as well. Very broad QRS complex, as we mentioned earlier, AV dissociation, where the P wave fluctuates back and forth across the QRS complex, and then fusion beats and capture beats. Again, we have the hybrid fusion beat here, and then we have the capture beat here, which looks mostly like a normal QRS complex. Next, we have Brugada sign, where the distance from the onset of the QRS to the nadir of the S wave is greater than 100 milliseconds. We have Josephson sign, which is going to be that non near the nadir of the S wave. And then we have positive or negative concordance. And then the RSR prime complex having the tall left rabbit ear versus the tall right rabbit ear, which you'd see in SVT with the Berency. And then finally, the other resource that I found very helpful was this life in the fast lane resource, which goes through VT versus SVT. And it talks about a lot of the criteria that we talked about earlier that suggest VT. So extreme axis deviation with the Northwest axis, QRS positive in AVR and negative in one and AVF. Broad complexes greater than 160 milliseconds, AV dissociation, capture beats, fusion beats, positive concordance, negative concordance, and then RSR prime complexes with a taller left rabbit ear, uh, Brugada sign and Josephson sign. So this is a great article to go through to really just nail home all of these points. But then there's a lot of other things that can help us def determine if it's VT or not as well. And one of the big ones that you're actually going to learn about is the Brugada criteria. And this is actually something that probably you're not going to be using that much as an internist. I think cardiologists are probably going to be using it more. But it's something that I even heard about and ba basically vaguely knew about even as a medical student. So it's something to be aware of, definitely. And basically, if any of these four questions are positive, 
then it's diagnostic for ventricular tachycardia. And you can see that the specificity is extremely high, specificity of 1, 0 0.98, 0 0.98, 0 0.965. And if all of them are negative, then you can diagnose supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, and that also has a very high specificity ratio. But it's kind of confusing going through these if you don't actually take images to see what they're actually talking about. So let's actually go through what it looks like to go through the Brugada criteria. So the first criteria is the absence of an RS complex in all precordial leads. And what this effectively boils down to is, does the patient have positive or negative concordance? So if there is positive or negative concordance, you can immediately diagnose VT. The reason that they say RS complex is basically because, um, well, I'll show you here. So here we have only an R complex, right? So that's positive concordance. Here we have only a negative S wave. So this is negative concordance. Whereas here in this particular example, we have RS complexes present. So you can see that there is an R wave and then there's an S wave, R wave, S wave. So there's kind of two components here. And so with this, we can't necessarily diagnose ventricular tachycardia right away. And we need to go to step two. And step two is going to be looking at that RS interval greater than 100 milliseconds. Again, that's the Brugada sign. And so basically you start from the beginning of the R complex, and then you measure to the bottom of the S complex. And if that's greater than 100 milliseconds, that's diagnostic for VT. And if you're looking at a regular EKG, that's going to be greater than 2.5 small boxes is going to be greater than 100 milliseconds. If it is less than 100 milliseconds, then we next need to go to step three, which is going to be looking for that AV dissociation, which again, uh, I said earlier is highly specific for VT. So here you can see how the uh, P waves have really no correlation with the QRS. You can see a P wave embedded here and then here. And if it's present, then VT is diagnosed. But finally, if none of these are positive, so AV dissociation is also not seen, then we need to go to step four, which is a little bit more uh, involved. Uh, and this is going to be assessing for morphological criteria for VT. So looking into this, VT has two different types of morphologies. So if you have a positive uh, complex, also known as a dominant R wave in V1, then this is called a right bundle branch block like morphology. If you have a dominant negative or dominant S wave in lead V1, then this is called a left bundle branch like morphology. So here again, mainly positive in V1. So this is right bundle branch like. And then here we have mainly negative. So this is left bundle branch like. So if the patient has a right bundle branch block like morphology or a positive QRS complex in lead V1, then we look for these particular criteria. So in V1 through V2, we're looking for a smooth monophasic R wave, or we're looking for that taller left rabbit ear appearance, or we're looking for a small Q wave leading into a tall R wave appearance. So here they put an example of the tall, taller left rabbit ear appearance, which would be kind of diagnostic of VT. What you're also looking for is in lead V6, you're looking for a QS complex, which is a completely negative complex in lead QS with no R wave. Or you're looking for an R to S ratio less than one. And basically this means you have a very small R wave and then a very big S wave. And so if you see that pattern, that is also diagnostic for ventricular tachycardia. In contrast with SVT, you may see an R to S ratio greater than one, where the R complex is actually much bigger and then the S complex is smaller. So that would be more suggestive of SVT. Now let's look into a patient with left bundle branch block like morphology, which is a dominant negative wave in lead V1. So now we're going to look at the R wave in lead one, V1 through V2. And if the R wave is greater than 30 to 40 milliseconds in duration, you have the Josephson sign, which is the notch or slurring in the S wave. Or if the R to S interval is greater than 60 to 70 milliseconds, that's all suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. And then finally with V6, again, we're going to be looking for QS waves, which is just that purely negative uh, wave with no R wave in lead V6, or we're going to be looking again for a QR complex with a tiny Q wave before the R wave in lead V6, and that's going to suggest VT. So here you can see an example of the tiny Q wave leading to the R wave, which is diagnostic for the QR complex that we're looking for. In contrast, if you look at SVT with left bundle branch block, you will not see any Q waves in V6. So this is an example that they show here. All right, so the best way to practice this is to actually go through some examples. And 
And so what's great about this website is they give you some examples to practice this on. So here we've got a patient who's clearly tachycardic. They've definitely got a, a prolonged QRS. I would say that the QRS is not really too prolonged. It's definitely a little prolonged, but it's not too significant, right? So that's already suggestive of one potential diagnosis. Now, if we go through the Brigada criteria, then we can go through it step by step to see if any of the Brigada criteria are met. So step one of the Brigada criteria is to assess for concordance. So in lead V1, we have a negative QRS complex, negative. And then in V3, V4, and onwards, we have positive. So we do not have any concordance in this EKG. The next step we're going to be looking for is for the R to S interval being greater than 100 milliseconds. So here we've got an R wave right here, and then we have the nadir of the S wave right here. And if we kind of estimate here, it looks pretty close together. So I would wager to say that this is not greater than 100 milliseconds. So next we move on to step three, which is looking for AV dissociation. So we're going to be looking at lead two would be a good place to look to see if there's any signs of AV dissociation. Do we see any P waves that are kind of just marching about with no um, association with the QRS complexes? And I don't really see that. So I don't see any signs of AV dissociation. Finally, we're going to be looking for morphological criteria for VT. So first we're looking at lead V1. We see it's predominantly negative. So this is going to be a left bundle branch like morphology. So in leads V1 through V2, do we see that uh, prolonged R to S interval? Do we see uh, R to S greater than 30 to 40 milliseconds? Or do we see Josephson sign with uh, the slurred notch in the S wave? We do not see that. And then in lead V6, do we see a purely negative QS complex? No, we don't see that. And we also don't see a Q wave. So none of the Brugada criteria are met here. So this is going to be SVT with left bundle branch block. Now, let's look at example two. So in this patient, again, tachycardic, wide QRS complex, and then we can start going through the Brigada criteria again. So first of all, do we see concordance or not? So it's up going, up going, and then down going after that. So we don't see any concordance. The second step is to check for the R to S interval being greater than 100. And if I look at the start of the R interval here, and then I look at the nadir of the S interval right here, that does look larger than 2.5 small boxes to me. And so that probably does meet the Brugada criteria. So just based off that alone, we can already probably diagnose ventricular tachycardia in this patient. But just to continue practicing, um, we can just go through the rest of the criteria. So next would be looking for AV dissociation. And it can be really hard to tell AV dissociation. But if you look here, it does look like we have potentially some P waves that are kind of interspersed, like this little bump right here. And there's some bumps here. And there's just different morphologies here, which could be potential AV waves that are really dissociated here. So there's potentially AV dissociation here. And then finally, if we go through the morphological criteria, so first we have an upright QRS in lead V1. So that's right bundle branch block morphology. You know, this is stuff that I'm going to have to look up all the time too, because I'm not going to remember all of this. So we're going to look for a smooth monophasic R wave, a taller left rabbit ear, or a QR complex. So let's take a quick look at that. So here I would say, you know, we actually have a taller right rabbit ear here. So that doesn't really fit. We don't have a smooth monophasic uprise and we don't have a QR complex. And then in lead V6, we don't have a pure negative QS complex and we don't have a QR complex uh, with an initial Q wave either. So, but still this is going to be monomorphic VT. So here you can say, you know, there's some signs suggestive of SVT with aberrancy, given that the complexes are not that broad and the right rabbit ear is taller than the left. However, on closer inspection, there are signs of AV dissociation. Oh, and also there is an R to S ratio less than one in V6, right? So we have this small R wave and then this gigantic S wave. So that meets, meets the R to S ratio greater than one criteria. All right. And one last one uh, that I would just want to do really quickly. Um, so this patient right here has, a wide complex tachycardia. But clearly here, we've got something going on right before all of the QRS complexes, and that's going to be a pacer spike, right? And so remember that we stated that one of the other causes of regular wide complex tachycardia is going to be pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So this is clearly a patient who is ventricular paced because there's a wide, bizarre QRS complex. It's coming from the ventricle. And we are getting this kind of appearance right here. So this is a ventricular paced rhythm, for example, pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So anyways, that's my quick rundown on the evaluation and diagnosis of wide complex tachycardia and how to differentiate SVT with aberrancy with ventricular tachycardia. Remember that if you're ever in doubt, assume that it's ventricular tachycardia. But now hopefully this video has helped you 
know a lot of the signs and different things that will be suggestive of VT and also taught you how to use the Brugada criteria to differentiate between the two different arrhythmias. The next step that we have to talk about is how to manage ventricular tachycardia. Please let me know if you have any comments, questions, or you know suggestions in the comments down below or any corrections to anything I said. Uh, I would love to hear your advice on how you like to approach this subject. And next, we're going to talk about how to actually manage ventricular tachycardia. And that's going to be in this next video right here. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in that next video. Thanks again for watching and peace.